Thank you for streaming Cities After, a radical exploration into the capitalist contradictions of our urban world and the many anti-capitalist futures to come. This is a Democracy at Work production, and I'm your host, Miguel robles -Duran. In today's episode, we have two wonderful uh, border citizens of the Tijuana San Diego border region that have been dedicating all their lives into working in conditions of migration and uh, border development and both of them have been developing uh, a wonderful project over the years, uh, which has now finally uh, started to materialize into a series of uh, stations that they called um, uh, between the two cities, between the San Diego and the Tijuana uh, region. Um, uh, let me uh, tell you a little bit about who they are, a little bit of their bio. Uh, Fona Foreman uh, is a professor of political theory at the University of California in San Diego and is also the founding director of the UCSD Center on Global Justice. Her work focuses on climate justice, border and migration, and participatory urbanization. She also serves as co-chair of the University of California's Global Climate Leadership Council. Teddy Cruz is an architect, Guatemalan architect, and a professor of public culture and urbanization at the Department of Visual Arts at the University of California in San Diego. He is known internationally for his research of the border region, Tijuana, San Diego, that has advanced neighborhoods as a site of cultural production from which to rethink urban policy, questions of affordable housing, and public space. Together, they're principals of Estudio Teddy Cruz Fona Forman, that is a research-based political and architectural practice uh, in San Diego and Tijuana, investigating the border, its informal urbanization, its conditions of climate resilience, its civic infrastructure, and its public culture. They have led a variety of urban and research agendas in civic uh, and public interventions between the border region. And their work is widely known, has been exhibited in the most prestigious uh, cultural institutions around the world, including the MoMA, the Cooper Hewitt Museum, Das Haus Kulturen in the Welt uh, in Berlin, um, and in different biennials uh, over the years. Uh, at the moment, they have two monographs um, that uh, have currently been published by MIT Press, um, uh, one that are called Specializing Justice, one book is called Building Blocks, and the other one is called Socializing Architecture, Top Down, Bottom Up. And they're currently working uh, on another book called Unwailing Citizenship, um, this one by Verso uh, uh, Press. I want to start by asking, uh, I guess, an, an elemental question. Those of you that have been living at the border, working at the border for so many years, um, I don't want to give up your age, but it's been quite a few decades that you've been uh, working diligently on conditions, border conditions. Um, certainly, you have seen a lot of changes, right, uh, over the decades, and most people think that a big moment in change of change was when Donald Trump took office, um, and um, I wonder if you could tell us a bit of what you have seen that has changed. Uh, in my previous episode, I mentioned uh, a bit the migration patterns coming that moving from Mexicans to Central Americans and now most South Americans, right? But that's not so much related to U.S. politics vis-a-vis -vis the border and vis-a-vis -vis Tijuana. Uh, what are your perceptions you that are constantly on the ground working on this? You know, the Trump years were hugely traumatic. Um, intensifying many of the stressors that this region already faces. Look, there's always been a breakdown between what goes on here in real life on the ground and the sort of political perceptions and cultural perceptions from afar. And um, I think what happened during that period is there was such an onslaught of broad cultural hostility toward the border 
and people who inhabit the border region. What happens is those perceptions become internalized. There was such a dramatic fear um, in this region during that period, it was palpable. Um, and all of the kinds of shenanigans that can go on when an administration wants to target border communities. So things like extra legal deportation, you know, people could be plucked out of neighborhoods and popped over the border invisibly, right, without any sort of official process. So there was always the fear of the kind of proverbial knock at the door. And so we work very closely uh, with partners in these communities, and we witnessed the kind of hunkering down and fear um, that, that people were experiencing. But again, we were so always and forever impressed with the resilience of these neighborhoods to sort of absorb whatever comes their way and figure out strategies to resist and to survive. Um, and that, that's, the, that's the ongoing sort of thread here is this determination, regardless of what comes along, um, to manage and to move forward. And, and you were mentioning, um, um, I assume most of these neighborhoods were, that you're referring to are the ones that, that had a lot of uh, undocumented migrants in the San Diego side. Um, in the Mexican side, from the Tijuana side, um, I mean, you are going constantly, and even during the pandemic, uh, you you shifted there in a, you know in a very very strange sort of political situation with border being closed and all of that. Um, from the Tijuana side, what what has changed uh, in the last years? I mean, in reality, this has always been a place uh, that we consider a microcosm of all the indignities and injustices experienced by vulnerable vulnerable people everywhere in the world. So yes, in the recent years, that has been exacerbated, but this has always been a geography of conflict, really a kind of epicenter, ultimately, of radical inequality between what is effectively one of the richest counties in the world, closer to some of the poorest informal settlements of Latin America crashing against the border wall. So this place has always been a place of crisis. Uh, so uh, that's the reason this has been the uh, you know, focus of our practice, as you said earlier, we are really committed to this environment because conflict itself, uh, not only, you know, across all these registers, but urban conflict has always been our creative tool. Um, and to penetrate that deeply and specifically uh, bringing us away from the broad, uh, you know, speculations and cliches that are ultimately abstracted in our academic environments, we really want to penetrate deeply understanding the specificity of the political inscribed in this territory. So yes, the political violence and the rhetoric of xenophobia and anti-immigration has always been part of the, of the life, the everyday life of this environment. I wanted to say this, obviously, this has been exacerbated uh, first in the kind of materialization of the culture of surveillance uh, uh, across the border. Uh, we all know that from uh, late 60s, early 70s, there was no wall. Uh, maybe it began as a chain link fence and later began to harden and uh, all the way to now, when in fact that has been thickened even uh, in terms of a surveillance apparatus. Uh, and in, during the Trump years, obviously this became even more of a stronger slap on the face uh, to our neighbors uh, to the south. So yes, imagine living in Tijuana where you have to witness that border wall almost uh, uh, every day. Uh, it's a very different psychology, a different perception uh, of how that, um, that sense of rejection uh, and, 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 and injustice really is part of your um, you know, everyday activities. Uh, I would argue that 80% or more of uh, San Diegans have never seen the, the border wall itself. Uh, so yes, it presents a very important psychological burden uh, and, and an impact in, in the way a city develops and unfolds itself through time. It's a very important sort of, um, uh, I guess, imaginary that exists between the two different cities. You know, even though mo most people that have never been in that region, it's very difficult to imagine how close they are. They're literally the only thing that divides them. It's a wall, right? The urbanization continues from one side to the other. And nevertheless, as you say, it's very important from a psychological perspective that most San Diegans have never seen the wall, whereas most people from Tijuana, I would argue 100% of them have seen the wall, right? It's, it's almost more, it's much more present in, in the way that, that you see it. Now, adding to the question that I first posed, um, I wonder like, 
at the moment, the politics of migration since Trump, but uh, currently uh, it's uh, headlines. It's making headlines everywhere, right? Um, first, starting with the caravans of like migrants coming from South America, Central America, um, all the way into the situation where uh, right now you have fascist states in the United States, uh, neo-fascist states such as Texas, you know, that is uh, pulling, you know, migrants on buses and sending them in everywhere. Um, especially in the eastern and northern sort of states. Um, you mentioned that the conflicts has, have always existed. It's a conflict zone. But have you seen any particular changes? Uh, and that's what I want to get to um, uh, in from the Tijuana side, because clearly a lot of this is being absorbed in Tijuana, right? Uh, more than, than the other side. And can you just so mention what, how you... How you are perceiving these changes? You know, the, the, the waves of migration have been coming in, in different sort of uh, periods. You know, the, the earliest, we were actually very inspired early on when um, Haitians began to arrive in Tijuana. There was a, an incredible opening and a welcoming of a kind of a racial, uh, uh, you know, a racial group that Tijuana had never witnessed before. And people were opening their doors. And there was this sense that there would be a hopeful kind of integration. You know, women and children were able to cross, men were staying behind. So suddenly there was this very large population of Haitian men um, in Tijuana. And the initial, you know, the initial response was very good, but what's happened over time is there's a kind of a deepening sort of racism that's emerging in Tijuana, which is very difficult to see. And that sort of paved the way for a continuing racism against arriving Central Americans that are just really sort of accelerating now because of violence, you know, climate change, agricultural instability, and the promise of more border porosity. There's people are, are drawn north right now. And so, you know, in a in a site of already scarce resources, Mexicans are concerned that you know people are arriving and are going to siphon away resources that are intended for other purposes. So what we're witnessing is a, 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 a massive arrival of people who are settling on the periphery and, and developing informal, um, informal settlements close to the maquilas. So it's, it's just intensifying you know, urbanization patterns that are here and all of the environmental challenges that informal urbanization has. One of the things that we've, you know, we've thought a lot about is, you know, the, again, the cultural and narrative challenges of arriving masses and the tendency to see caravans and movement of people from above in mass and the way it dehumanizes the individual struggle and the human rights of individuals who are fleeing horrible conditions and arriving here and seen within a mass, it's much easier to violate the human rights and dignity of individuals who are struggling. So from a human rights perspective, it's an absolute catastrophe. And just to say one, one more thing, you know, asylum uh, policies in the US have been suspended and erratic over the years, policies that should be guaranteed by international law. One of the problems that we're witnessing here, and this is a new problem and an accelerating problem, is that many of the people who are coming north are driven to do so because of agricultural challenges. Something like 72% of arriving migrants at our southern border right now are agricultural workers, and that agricultural instability was a major factor. The problem is they're not seen by the international human rights community as refugees. So they're not entitled to international refugee protection. So they don't get international aid. There's local hostility toward them, and they're just waiting at the wall, and nothing is happening. There's this kind of this, this terrifying stasis while human lives are just spiraling down. What, 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 you're, what you're saying is, is, is very telling also the coming crisis due to climate change, because, I mean, in part, the, the, the agricultural sort of shifts that are happening in South America have to do with this and another part have to do with neoliberalism, right? That that it's the, <clears throat> the industrialization of the rural areas, the, the dispossession of uh, rural populations of their land because of industries, you know, specifically uh, international industries uh, settling there and so on. And in some ways repeats a bit of the, the early patterns of migration uh, in the um, 80s with the Mexicans moving to the United States, which as, as I've told my audience, is not so much 
that Mexicans are the ones that are moving there, but it's like you're seeing how there's a transition from different populations from the South that um, right. are running from terrible conditions or are trying to get you know, into a better point of something that has been produced primarily by the West, right? Whether it's climate change or whether it's the neoliberal sort of impetus and you know, the capitalist impetus of transforming all of that. One thing that I, that I um, always have admired about your practice is that even though you are mostly uh, sort of um, working on the American side in the sense of like your professional things, you're all the time in the Southern side. And what you've been trying to do is, is find forms of, of redistributing the resources, almost understanding, okay, like we are um, very much responsible for this. And you were trying to find ways of funneling resources into uh, developing projects on the ground, you know, uh, with uh, uh, different populations. And, and as I've been reading your recent work, you know, first started with the Haitians, you know, uh, people that were migrating from Haiti. Um, and now there's a, a large number of South Americans that are there uh, that are, are uh, working on this. I wonder if, um, what was, what prompted this work? I mean, both of you had um, a, a, a wish, uh, a drive uh, to be able to do this work, right? And it has not been easy. And I know that you've been struggling for years and decades, right, in order to achieve these kinds of projects. But what what was in there, uh, in your practices, right, that uh, had had to push you there, like put you into that element? You know, can you tell us a little bit about that? Obviously, one condition that has really shifted, or at least um, pushed us, all of us working here, uh, to challenge our own practices, really. Um, for example, really transforming our notions of hospitality, transforming uh, our understanding of rights. I'm referring to the previous question a bit as well, because in our relationship with very rooted grassroots organizations, nonprofit organizations, activist groups uh, with whom we have been really confronting many of these challenges together collaboratively, uh, it's, there has been an understanding recently because of the failures of asylum the processes and the again, the kind of rejection that has been unprecedented in recent years, that right now we all need to really be fighting not only for the rights of the migrant to migrate, obviously because of political violence, economic uh, uh, you know, catastrophe, and ultimately climate uh, uh, change and so on. But now more than ever also, we need to really be fighting for the rights of the migrant to remain if they choose to. Uh, so this idea that uh, migrant shelters uh, can really be more than just uh, transitional zones of service provision, uh, but actually should be incremental infrastructures of permanency. Uh, this really resonated a lot based on our own work, which really has focused on the impact of immigrants, the positive impact of immigrants in transforming our very cities, uh, the American neighborhoods ultimately our interventions in the informal settlements of Tijuana have also been inspired by the idea of really developing the city incrementally um, as resources become available, as the negotiation of boundaries and human capacities are increased. Uh, so somehow I think as uh, many migrants from Haiti, from Central America and Latin America really began to impact the city of Tijuana, many of them were finding shelter in, in public spaces that ultimately were deficient in, in, in the inability to, to, to really support them. And everybody began to flow, uh, to, to move into the informal settlements. Um, so the idea that the city can begin to be built incrementally and the migrant is our partner uh, was really an, an incredible, um, let's say, a context to begin developing many of our sanctuary spaces with our partners. So the idea again uh, that, um, that it is really about, um, maybe let's, let me say it this way, recently, because of the impact of all these issues, um, many artists have flocked into the border region. You don't imagine how many calls we get from people trying to really find a way for us to introduce them to sites and partners. And obviously we've been here for a long, long time. And even though we are not at all critical of the ephemeral gestures of resistance that many artists want to come here and enact and perform, 
we always ask who is going to be there the day after the event, the day after the happening, who is going to take care of representing many of these issues to really push against the institutions to transform the very quality of life uh, of these environments. So for us was uh, recently uh, really to say our practice will even go deeper in, in, in really rooting itself in the long term. So it's really about a kind of uh, permanency or really going along with these communities in, uh, and really being with them in the long haul. And that's where we actually began to realize that this is also an institutional project that we needed to bring our own uh, university to be uh, a partner, a, a long-term and meaningful partner with our community partners uh, to tackle many of these conditions. One of the reasons I think you're so, your work is so admired is that both of you have been pushing the boundaries of what people think are the disciplines that you belong to. In your case, Teddy, uh, you studied architecture, um, and in your case, Fauna, you studied political science. And even in your within your institutions, you've been challenged, right? Like, you know, like, uh, are you really, you know, an architect, or are you really a political scientist, or is that what you're supposed to be doing? And I wonder, before we start getting into how you built up these projects in the South, I I would like to hear a bit on on, on how has been your positionality in terms of how you see the traditions of your disciplines vis-a-vis -vis what they need to be. Sure. I, so, you know, in the social sciences, it's, you know, um, the, this tendency to see ourselves as objective observers of reality that measure and make predictions on empirical data. Um, and it's modeled off the, off the natural sciences that if you touch the subject, you're somehow polluting the science. And we've really stripped the social sciences, so many fields have stripped the social sciences of the sort of what was, you know, in a sort of Deweyan sense, a, a problem solving agenda, right? Actually using research to, to address social problems. Now, you know, the, 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 the challenges that so many social scientists are addressing are generated by the discipline, not by things that are actually happening. Um, in the world. So I've been called a social worker in my field. I was um, held back from promotion because my work was seen as activist. And if you do activist social science, you're not a real scientist. And so I've had terrible struggles at the university gaining legitimacy uh, for, for the sort of work that I do. Um, and um, they've come around. <laughs> it's taken it's taken some time. Um, but you know, we've really tried to use the university as a vehicle for engaging the challenges that surround this public university, and you know, to sort of, you know, uh, validate our public mission. Um, but it, but it's definitely been a struggle. And Teddy and I, working on opposite sides of the campus, that in itself was a struggle as well, because these are two entirely different merit cultures and different ways of understanding. Um, production value um, in 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 the social sciences. Cultural work is denigrated; it's undervalued, right? So th the partnership um, was not always, um, you know, welcomed by by many people on the campus. Maybe you can say something about yes, and the, and and ultimately the possibility, right? That social scientists ultimately, uh, in their effort to recognize the problems uh, end up only measuring obviously the problems whether through econometrics or many other methodological sort of approaches but very seldom they advocate very seldom they really tell us how to transcend those problems in fact the center on global justice that fauna uh, uh, created initially the university she wanted actually she wanted to name the center center for or uh, center for uh, uh, global justice uh, but the university felt that it was too directly an advocacy. It, it sounded too much like an advocacy that we should remain a bit neutral. And part, part of that really, I think, is challenging how the research developed by the university ultimately remains just really catering to researchers themselves and the institutions that validate that and never, very seldom becomes a powerful tool to enter into those environments uh, 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 to support, the, the, in fact, the struggles on the ground in many of these communities that we engage. So yes, it was about creating, a, 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 in our case, it was intervening into those protocols of the university, not only to make social scientists and other you know, technologists to think more spatially 
uh, in their own approaches to the issues, but also humanities, right? Also architects to think more ethically and more politically, more socially. So it's about this interpenetration we are all really uh, pursuing. But at the end of the day is how in our, through our practice, our research, we could intervene into the rigidity of those academic protocols uh, to in fact find new channels that transcended those epistemic walls and those, um, the lack of a, a connection and linkage with uh, the issues on the ground. So that's how we created this uh, sort of platform to create. Uh, and what this platform did, the Center on Global Justice gave us an agility that we couldn't have if we were accountable to you know, deans and department heads. So we had this, this truly cross-disciplinary space where we, you know, we received our own grants, controlled our own budgets, hired our own management staff so that we could create a management culture that would actually work for the kinds of projects that we were taking on. The university didn't have mechanisms or processes in place to be able to channel research grants, for example, to community agencies that we were working with. So we had to basically create all of these protocols de novo uh, from a space that we were able to oversee ourselves. You both are seen as people that are working at the fringes or let's say at the edge or the, at the forefront of a specific disciplinary orientation um, that does not permit the type of things that you do, right? Um, you have the center, which is gives you a very independent thing, right? Independent thing. But nevertheless, you have to develop all kinds of coalitions, all kinds of decisions. But correct me if I'm wrong, but I've always seen your work, as I've said at the beginning, as trying to take resources and follow those resources of rich universities, such as the University of California, right? Um, and other partners into projects that, you know, develop something else, right? In this case, it's very interesting because you're taking... American money mostly, right? Uh, and then moving it through the border, right? And taking action with very, very specific projects over there. So tell us about how was it to make those coalitions? What kind of coalitions did you need to make? I'm talking right now from the North side, and then we can talk about the coalitions that you have built in the South, in, in the Tijuana part, in the Tijuana region, which are also super, super well thought out. So, I mean, one of the things we've realized doing this work over time is that we can actually mobilize the, the resources, the knowledges, the social networks, and sort of capacity of the university to benefit communities as they're developing their own projects. So the university can open doors and open pathways and funding opportunities from state agencies, from philanthropy, from, you know, from funders that communities might not otherwise have access to. So in that sense, we've sort of been a coyote, you know, bringing these resources to the community, but simultaneously, and it's very important to say this, that we've always seen these flows as moving in a sort of horizontal, in a dual direction, right? So as we bring these resources into the community, we're smuggling the resources of the community into the university to change its priorities, to change the way it educates, to change the way it understands community engagement, moving it from a kind of charitable model or a humanitarian model, which is always vertical, to a collaborative model where resources and knowledges are being shared and circulated. So what we're hoping to do is simultaneously change the way the university does business, change the way it operates as a neighbor in this community uh, on both sides of the border. This pertains, all this desire, all this, the way that our practice has unfolded through, through years. And it begins with what we were saying earlier, obviously, as we investigate the positive impact of immigrants, migrant communities is really, are really our partners in the neighborhoods, the underserved, marginalized neighborhoods where they settle. Uh, as we investigate that positive impact of immigrants transforming these environments, we're trying to investigate also new forms of political representation. So we have always understood our practice as a practice of mediation, trying to intervene in the interface between top-down institutional resources and the bottom-up intelligence of those migrant communities. Obviously, we see migrant communities as a DNA to really harvest from a creative intelligence that is also mobilized by empathy, by solidarity, but very interesting everyday practices that are also economic in nature in terms of informality, but also collaborative forms of local governance. So all that uh, creative intelligence needs to be politically represented, picked up 
and taken upwards to knock on the doors of the exclusionary institutions that have marginalized them. So hopefully uh, uh, to transform uh, urban policy and public policy. This is where the university becomes an important platform of representation. And often we don't really see that. Nobody is really tapping into that. So our practice inside the university has become a, a, a way, as Fon has said, a kind of cultural coyote, right? Of uh, linking, the to link the specialized knowledge of the university with the creative intelligence of communities. Uh, how do we construct a platform for uh, a reciprocal knowledge so that the creative knowledge of activists on the ground can be, bring, can be brought into, into the university uh, to reorganize our research, research agendas and our priorities and even our forms of pedagogy and education, but also how uh, researchers and faculty and students can come into uni the, the communities uh, to partner with uh, our um, obviously, uh, you know, uh, with our with, with community activists and leaders to really advance new forms of economic and urban development. Yes, we discovered that the economic power of the public university can be leveraged for communities to develop their own migrant housing and public spaces. That has been was really the discovery uh, that we. Uh, you know, found uh, in order to produce a, a, a very new model of cross-sectorial uh, urban development. One thing that we say often, Fon and I said, while the so-called urban revolution arrives, what do we do in the meantime? And for us, it was an, an important project of institutional critique to infiltrate ourselves into existing models of economic development set up by developers and other institutions, how we hijack that knowledge and allow, in fact, communities to become developers of their own housing and their own public infrastructure, uh, uh, supported by, again, our public university here, uh, so that they can really have uh, the tools and also um, the means of production uh, to really uh, advance their own uh, you know, local forms of urbanization. No, that's, that's wonderful. I, I think it it um, it also emphasizes I, in, in two episodes ago, I was mentioning that it's, it's so important to understand uh, that it is possible to create ruptures and, and fractures uh, in the form in which capitalist listen functions within urban environments and how those smaller fractures can in return come back, you know, and change policy. Uh, in a macro dynamic, right? So there's, it's not only that the macro informs and dictates over sort of the, the small, but the, it is possible that that you, by working on on smaller pieces of infrastructure, which we're going to start to talk about, you know, the community stations that you've been working on, how those stations have managed to change policy at a different level, right? Even though um, that right now we're discussing institutional arrangements, but I think it also has had an impact in governmental arrangements, especially from the side of mayors in Tijuana and 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 also the, the different sort of political connections that exist between different governments, right? So that I've always found that you, your belief um, in that it is possible acting directly on the small with the intelligence of understanding that how that small can become bigger as that knowledge you know, enters into institutional and governmental arrangements. I've always found it super motivating. Now, with those um, community stations, right? Um, clearly, you had to come with a, an idea of what it needed to happen. You needed to have the convincing argument, you know, towards your funding members, towards the institution, and so on. What, what were, what, 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 what are they, right? How do you? Uh, pitch them, right? What what exactly were you trying to create and that you have created and you are continuing to create? Just descriptively, the community stations are a network of field stations located on both sides of the border, two in San Diego, two in Tijuana. Each one is a deep rooted partnership with a local sort of a grassroots community agency. Um, and each one of them really began in very organic ways through research partnerships, design partnerships between us on the campus and these community organizations. Um, each one is different. So each one corresponds to the challenges faced by those particular communities. But what they all share is thinking together how to co-develop space for community benefit. In some, in some cases, the spaces 
um, take the shape of vacant parcels adjacent to, you know, uh, 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 infrastructure that the community uh, agency owns. In other spaces, it's uh, public space. So it, it's, it, it really uh, varies from space to space. But the idea was that how could we, from the base of the university, work with the community agency to, re to reimagine that space in a participatory way? And at the same time, these spaces then become sites of university research and student training and so forth, sites of circulation between uh, the campus and the community. And each one sort of moves according to its own temporalities. One of, one of the challenges that we faced is that the urgencies that drive these communities are working at a very different temporality than the capacity of the university. So it's very, very hard and slow to move the bureaucracy to get money and resources and programming developed and so forth in these sites. Uh, but the urgencies are very fast. And so we have to figure out how to calibrate these temporalities and these expectations and align um, our capacities, which isn't always smooth and easy. Sometimes it's rough and bumpy and creates conflicts. Um, sometimes community engagement is, is conflictual right and 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 um and challenging um but in the end each one of these spaces has now become a sanctuary in these communities right for education for cultural activity for participatory urban design for advocacy for engaging uh, agencies on the community you know community's challenges One and so thing forth. that uh, reading about the the stations the community stations that it's very important is that you started to conceive them the, the migrants not only not anymore as, as as sort of migrants that are flowing towards somewhere else but it's you asked to, to start to ask the questions like many of the people that are going there are never going to be able to cross uh, or it's going to be very complicated uh, as they you know move on in their lives within the Tijuana structure and so you started to question well have someone thought about they're going to stay they're going to become part of this community they're they're going to be you know uh, members of the society at large and I don't think it had ever happened I mean there was no project that had attempted to actually understand uh, those migrants in Tijuana as, as permanent residents, right? Um, most people, still a lot of government treats them as something that is going to disappear at some point, right? Um, but in your case, not. And so you start to think about how to program these stations. And uh, and that's where, it, you know, yeah, you can tell us a little bit about what was the idea, what ideas uh, started to appear, you know, to develop this. So in essence, in our minds, obviously, the community stations as a as this network of sanctuary spaces is really a way of spatializing social and urban justice. I, we truly believe that social justice, urban justice is a distributive concept for us, demanding the redistribution, not only of resources, but also the redistribution of knowledges. Uh, and in that sense, we really depart from the fact that the, the community is not just a recipient, a needy recipient, of resources, but in fact, it is a repository of knowledges, practices that again have inspired our own our own uh, our own work. Um, uh, so, the model of the community stations that is not only well, it's a double project. Again, the model of the community stations is about a double project. On one hand, it's a collaborative educational model linking university and community to co-produce and co-curate and co-manage activities pertaining to education and research. Um, but at the same time, it is a shared model of urban development. Uh, many of our community partners have uh, slivers of land, even in Tijuana, um, uh, resources, and obviously, as we said earlier, uh, the economic power and programmatic power of, of our university has always also become leverage for communities to develop their own neighborhood infrastructure. Um, so one example of this, we have four community stations, two in San Diego, two in Tijuana. One example of this is one in San Diego, uh, where in fact we found a four acre piece of land that is owned by the school district in San Diego. And because of our partnership with that particular um, nonprofit organization embedded in the Encanto communities, which is really the epicenter of poverty in San Diego, really the highly diverse demo demographics, um, it, 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 
this uh, partner, this community partner, the nonprofit organization dedicated to environmental justice issues, because of the partnership between UCSD and Groundwork San Diego, which is uh, our um, the group in this neighborhood, the school district uh, gave us access to that four acre piece of land uh, to co-develop it as a four acre open air climate action park for this underserved community, linking eight public schools that surround it. Um, and so all of a sudden we have access to land and the university has again connections to a network of foundation and philanthropic support and the linkage again of the school district, the grassroots organization and the university began to produce an amazing process of shared responsibilities and funding for advancing this uh, public space for uh, climate education. Now the school district is poised to invest $10 million in the physical infrastructure, while the university will uh, inject funding for all the educational and research activities and our community partners will summon the community for new forms of climate participatory activity. So it, all I'm trying to say is that, again, uh, these cross-sectorial uh, synergies to, um, to really summon uh, particular flows of fin financial uh, support and programmatic content really requires a lot of facilitation. I took a long time to describe this one, but uh, living rooms at the border in San Isidro became another model, which is really the first station that we actually built. Um, uh, it is a, a, a similar example where the nonprofit organization owned the land the university through us and through our own processes uh, uh, were able to raise enough funding to uh, create, transform an existing church that was falling apart really into a community theater flanked by social service pavilions and an open air uh, performance and educational uh, porch became our community station and became the seed, that investment became the seed for the nonprofit organization, our partners, Casa Familiar, to qualify for subsidies to construct a model of 10 social housing units that are threaded strategically to that public space. And now, thanks to the Mellon Foundation support, we're beginning to inject into those spaces, the, the community theater, the outdoor classroom pavilion, and the social service uh, uh, micro um, accessory units. Uh, we are beginning to inject cultural and educational programming in collaboration with our partners. So effectively, this is really about a new model of interface between social housing and public space, a public space that is not just about beautification, but is really deliberately injected with co-curatorial programming in perpetuity. Um, and finally, in Tijuana, uh, the, in the migrant shelter, which is really the third of the four community stations, it is a similar model. With our partners, we have been acquiring land, and now it is about migrant housing that is embedded in an infrastructure of productivity, fabrication workshops, health clinic, classrooms, collective kitchens, so that the migrant in the community can uh, advance cooperatives with us that can enable them to be in possession of their own modes of productivity, uh, job generation, and again, permanency if they choose to remain. All of these four stations that you're talking about, um, how do they link to each other? Because you always talk about this project as a as a as a, as a project, you know, as a, as a unity, you know, and having stations on one side, having stations on the other. Can you perhaps comment us on on how do you link them? What are the exchanges that happen between them? And most importantly, I think for me and from my audience, I mean, just to understand. Why do you think it was important to produce on both sides, you know, and what is what are both sides getting out of these uh, uh, exchange? You know, one of the things that drives this work and is really the content of our of our research activity in the Center on Global Justice is to understand the cross border flows and circulations that unite this region, imagining the region without the line, without the wall through the hydrological systems, through the canyon systems, through the shared culture, through the shared aspirations and hopes. I mean, these two cities historically have tended to look away from one another, right? Planning maps end at the border, north and south, right? And so we're trying to sort of amplify the shared interests and aspirations of people who, who inhabit this territory together and to identify a citizenship culture. So what really links these 
these community stations together are the cultural activities that take place within them. All of the pedagogic content of these stations is focused on reimagining our region and what we, what this region looks like without, without the wall. Um, yeah. And we partner very closely with environmental agencies on both sides of the border to actually do collaborative cross-border environmental interventions through the community stations network. So I would say this is really the community stations end up being an infrastructure for a kind of long-term form of resistance. Uh, injecting tools to increase community capacities for political action, to really transcend, transgress, produce coalitions on both sides, mm -hmm. projects that really is about, are about mutual recognition. The idea that these sanctuary spaces as public spaces is really about creating sites to construct that sensibility that Fona was talking about a new type of public and civic imagination transcending the stupidity and the, of the imposition of that political boundary that disrupts and you know, separates these communities. So it's about new forms of reciprocity that need new forms of education, dissemination, com you know, communication and so on, and, and commitments, long-term commitments for reciprocity. So I am thinking again, that public spaces, this network of sanctuary spaces is really about constructing citizenship mobilized by new forms of cultural action where a critical pedagogy is central to reorganizing sensibilities, changing hearts and minds, understanding that the border wall is a self-inflicted wound, not only separating us from the other, but really altering, uh, you know, uh, undermining our own social, environmental and economic resources. But um, what are the biggest challenges you're facing? How do you see this project? And this is gonna sound a bit uh, uh, sort of uh, negative as a question, but it's just mostly to, to make us understand what's happening there. How do you see this project failing if it fails? And how do you see it as its ultimate utopia in 10 years. So what would destroy this project? What are you fighting against that could actually cripple this project, right? What needs to change that you think that you need to push more in that direction? And once things are succeeding, because you've been working on this for many years, right? And the stations are there and so on. What is, on the other hand, the ultimate utopia? And I think you mentioned a bit on, on this, right? It's like, uh, the, the the border wall disappearing, you know, the, having some ultimate shares on these, um, the, the ultimate destination of the projects, right? And the way that I also see it is that you guys have been informing a new form of uh, urbanization. And, uh, and then both governments are also paying attention to this, right? And so it's a packed up question, right? But I do want to uh, know about what are you, what are your biggest challenges? And on the other hand, what is the ultimate dream? Our, our our biggest challenges, I, I think, um, are because the project is so local. Okay, so we've decided to devote our practice to very local work. And one of the great things about doing that is there's continual reinforcement and a continuous sense that you're moving forward and actually getting things done. You can actually see things happen on the ground and it creates a sense of satisfaction and you want to do more. And so there's this sort of self sort of perpetuating mechanism in doing local work and deepening partnerships. But when you step back just a little bit, you recognize that this local work is operating within a global political economy, which is fundamentally unjust. So you can shine this diamond and you can polish things again and again locally and feel very, very good. And in the end, ultimately that might be the key, right? To, to, to improving quality of life in this region is to really focus on the local. But all of these processes are getting, that, that we're situated in are getting worse and getting more severe and accelerated migration is, is inevitable. And so the, the stressors that we're facing are produced by geopolitical factors that are beyond our control, right? And so we know that this, that this is the lions are at the at the gate, right? So things are just intensifying around us right now. Climate change is deepening, you know, migration is accelerating. And the projects that we're developing now do not have the capacity to manage those intensifying conditions. 
right? So we don't know what the demographics in Tijuana are going to look like in five years, in 10 years, in 15 years. So the projects are very much in the moment, responding, the responsive projects. They're responding to challenges that we're facing right now in the moment. And they're satisfying for that reason, because we're making progress, we're getting things done. But it's hard to say what things are going to look like in this region in 5, 10, 15 years. One of the things that we've done in the last period, which has always been an aspiration for us, is to connect with universities along the entire trajectory of the border, all the way to Matamoros, Brownsville. So we're, we're working now with sort of um, sister universities on both sides of the border all the way along to understand the challenges that we're facing and to learn from one another. And we think that in sharing um, what we're all experiencing here in our very local regions can create more of a broader regional sensibility to kind of fortify our resistance to what's coming down, uh, coming down the road. Wonderful. Right, thank you very much for this amazing conversation. And uh, I hope to have you back uh, in the show uh, in the coming months, uh, uh, because we definitely need to keep on discussing about these issues. I really appreciate a lot uh, you being here, and I'm sure that the audience will also uh, have uh, had a wonderful time listening to both of you. And congratulations again with all these projects. Thank you. Thank you.